So we'll start with the case. We've got a 72-year-old veteran uh, with a history of a remote cabbage uh, that presents with an NSTEMI. Uh, his EKG on admission uh, had some infralateral uh, ST depressions. Um, <clears throat> angiography of the left side uh, showed a CTO of the LAD and a CTO of the circumflex um, and a ramus in the diag that were with some moderate disease. Um, he had a known atretic uh, lima, um, and previous angiography had a vein graft to the OM2 um, that had occluded uh, in the interim and was felt to be the IRA. So the vein graft was uh, easily wired with a workhorse wire um, and angiography following uh, the wire advancement um, showed no real change uh, in, the, uh, in the flow. So uh, sort of left with the question of uh, what to do, um, but before we go any further, we'll talk a little bit sort of about uh, intracoronary um, and sort of a large thrombus burden. Um, so the previous classification system um, had used the TIMI uh, scores um, where a grade zero represented no thrombus in the vessel uh, up to a grade five, which was a complete thrombotic occlusion. However, um, there is uh, a lot of ambiguity with a grade five lesion. Um, so to better clarify that, um, the spectrum was sort of divided into a large thrombus burden versus a no large thrombus burden. Um, and the group sort of defined this basically, basically using the reference vessel diameter of greater than 3.5 millimeters with TIMI zero flow and also based off of the angiography uh, of the thrombus. So does this even really matter? Um, and it does, and a large thrombus burden is associated with worse outcomes. Um, this study from 2014 by Napadano uh, showed that uh, patients with a large thrombus burden um, had a much higher incidence of distal embolization um, and a trend towards a higher incidence of no reflow. But besides these angiographic uh, findings, they also found um, that the infarct size index uh, represented a larger percentage of the left ventricle in patients with a large thrombus burden uh, compared to those without a large thrombus burden. Um, and also uh, on cardiac MRI findings, they found that there was a higher incidence of transmural necrosis uh, in patients with a large thrombus burden. And uh, part of that is due to distal embolization, um, which we already know is associated with poor outcomes. And it's frequently seen in patients uh, that present with an acute MI. It uh, can be seen in up to 15% of those patients. Um, and this is important because uh, distal embolization is associated with a lower likelihood of ST resolution, uh, higher infarct size, and worse mortality. So it's clear then that a uh, large thrombus burden and subsequent distal embolization are associated with poor outcomes, um, but does modifying that uh, adjust any of the outcomes? Um, trials, uh, the two trials that sort of come to mind are TASTE and TOTAL, um, and both of these looked at STEMI patients and uh, the role of routine aspiration thrombectomy, compared to those patients uh, undergoing routine aspiration compared to those with just PCI alone. Um, and the results were uh, essentially the, similar between the two groups. Um, and routine aspiration was not found to be superior to PCI alone. So that led to the 2015 ACC AHA guidelines that found that routine aspiration uh, was a class three uh, indication, um, but still reserved it um, for selective or as, as an option for bailout um, in certain cases. Um, and that was left as a 2B recommendation. So a lot of the, there's been a lot of uh, debate and sort of questions as to why both of those studies uh, failed to show any significant difference between the two groups uh, if large thrombus burden is associated with poor outcomes. Um, and part of that uh, rationale for that has been believed to be that aspiration uh, thrombectomy um, was maybe not completely successful in all of those patients and that there was still large residual thrombus burden uh, in that group. So this group from uh, Japan used OCT um, as a retrospective uh, analysis and looked at patients that were undergoing aspiration thrombectomy and quantified the amount of residual thrombus after uh, aspiration. The three groups were then divided uh, into, sorry, the groups were divided into tertiles and the groups on the, in gray, represent the groups with the largest residual thrombus. Um, so uh, they found that patients with a large residual thrombus had worse angiographic outcomes and they also found uh, that those patients with a large uh, thrombus burden uh, after aspiration also had a, a higher incidence of a, a higher peak uh, cardiac enzymes. So um, with the class 2B recommendation, the question sort of remains as to who really will benefit uh, from these therapies that are directed uh, towards thrombus. Um, and specifically, the patients that likely will benefit the most are those with a large thrombus burden, patients with a significant residual thrombus, uh, patients with poor flow down the vessel, a large anterior MI, or those patients presenting with a stent thrombosis. So what are our options for uh, managing thrombus? There's really a three-pronged approach, and we'll go through each of those uh, right now. So there's the pharmacological approaches, and the anticoagulants are the first and sort of the first step in each of this, but this is sort of um, a standard of therapy that uh, we're not going to really go into right now. 
um, but the second uh, role may be for 2B3As. And the question sort of is, is does uh, the method of 2B3A delivery matter? Um, in the study on the left, they compared intracoronary versus IV to 2B3A and found that there was no significant difference. Um, but in infused AMI, they compared intralesion uh, 2B3A compared to no uh, 2B3A. And this 2B3A was delivered uh, specifically by a delivery catheter to the lesion. And they found that there was a modest improvement um, and a decrease in the infarct size. So the pearl here, I think, is that when administering a bolus dose of 2B3A, it's really best to do that once the thrombus has been penetrated. And if it's possible, to ideally deliver it with a micro microcatheter if possible. The second one that's uh, sometimes a little bit tougher to do is to really actually uh, let the drugs work. Um, so the pictures on the left here are a patient that presented with an RCA STEMI. Um, aspiration thrombectomy was performed in the second uh, picture here with uh, evidence of a large thrombus burden with this, uh, improvement in the flow down the vessel, um, but still quite a significant thrombus burden. Um, and in this patient, the patient was treated with 72 hours of 2B3A uh, and returned to the cath lab uh, for a second look uh, with significant improvement in the thrombus burden. Um, and then finally, the patient underwent PCI with a good result. So this can be an option. Um, it can be a difficult option to uh, sometimes wait uh, for 24 to 72 hours. Um, but this ideally should be reserved in a patient that's clinically stable. The third approach to the pharmacologic is the, really the vasodilators. Um, and the goal of therapy here um, is to really prevent um, the episodes of no reflow when distal embolization does occur. And ideally, these meds should be all administered before lesion manipulation. And then finally, um, to round out this sort of group, uh, we have the potent P2Y12 inhibitors as well as intracoronary lytics, which are also an option. The second, uh, second prong is really the aspiration. And the two options for uh, microcatheters are the export and the Pronto LP. Um, both of these options are uh, catheters are specifically designed for aspiration thrombectomy. And the goal when performing this is really the technique. Ideally, this should be, uh, aspiration should be started one to two centimeters proximal to the lesion and advance slowly through the thrombus. And then while withdrawing, you want to make sure that you're still aspirating and aspirating blood from the guide catheter. The goal of this is to ideally prevent as much uh, distal embolization as possible while maximizing the amount of thrombus that's removed. The second option with aspiration are the large bore catheters. You can use a mother and child uh, catheter system, or you can use a guide extension catheter, uh, including the guide liner or the guide zilla. And when using the large bore uh, options, you want to make sure um, that a vacuum syringe is connected to the Y arm of the connector. Um, and, that, uh, and that allows uh, blood to be suctioned out of the guide as the uh, guide liner is being removed. Um, this uh, picture here is just sort of evidence that's in the picture on the left, a patient presented with an LED uh, STEMI. Uh, aspiration thrombectomy was performed with uh, some improvement in the flow down the vessel. Um, but you can see no reflow in the distal portion of the vessel. Aspiration thrombectomy was again performed into the distal portion of the vessel. A uh, small amount of thrombus was removed um, and flow down the vessel was restored. So finally, we'll discuss uh, the mechanical options for thrombus management. Um, the first one is uh, the angiojet thrombectomy device. And ultimately, what this is doing is a high, high pressure of saline um, that creates a negative vacuum of up to 600 millimeters per mercury um, that basically extracts thrombus and macerates it within the catheter and then subsequently removes it from the body. Ideally, when performing this, you want to do a single antegrade pass, which can reduce the episodes of radiarrhythmia. And you ideally want to go proximal to distal uh, to avoid distal embolization. The second option uh, is a laser atherectomy, which uses photochemical, mechanical, and thermal uh, sources. It uh, uses pulse wavelengths at 308 nanometers uh, that allows uh, thrombus uh, to be uh, vaporized, as well uh, as there may be an antiplatelet effect in stunning the platelets and preventing further aggregation. The catheters are available in 0.9 up to 2 millimeters. Um, and in this picture here, a patient again presented with an RCA STEMI. Um, you see thrombus sort of in the mid portion of the vessel. Uh, laser atherectomy was performed with a good result and allowed uh, subsequent uh, PCI. Ideally, when using this, you want to use a 0.9 to 1.4 millimeter catheter um, and uh, ideally want to go slow uh, in the integrate. That allows the tissue to absorb as much of the energy as possible. And uh, the third option is an open filter withdrawal. Um, this was a case series of nine patients that were reported in the UK. Um, they specifically looked at a type of thrombus that was known as a cannonball-like thrombus. Um, what they used was a uh, EV3 spider filter, and they use a filter that is slightly bigger than the vessel diameter. It's delivered distally and then retrieved in an open fashion, um, and then retrieved to the uh, guide. But you want to make sure that the neck uh, is the only portion that's retrieved. Um, and they found that in eight of the nine patients, they had a complete thrombus removal. One dissection, though. Um, and the final option is the MGARD stent. Uh, 
um, and this was a bare metal stent, um, not currently approved in the United States, um, but it was covered with an ultra thin uh, flexible PET mesh sleeve, and it was to help prevent distal embolization by reducing uh, the extrusion of uh, thrombotic material. It did uh, show a decrease in the episodes of distal embolization. However, it was associated with uh, more frequent episodes of stent thrombosis as well as target lesion revascularization. So returning back uh, to our case, uh, lesion was wired, sort of uh, went with a multi-pronged approach here. Balloon angioplasty was performed first. Export uh, catheter was used for aspiration. Again, minimal improvement uh, in the flow. And then uh, laser atherectomy was performed using a 0.9 millimeter uh, spectronetics catheter. And you can see that there's uh, some um, moderate improvement in the flow. Um, now you can see the native vessel as well. Balloon angioplasty was performed and a total of four overarching drug looting stents were placed um, with, a, with a good result. Um, so that's it. Thanks. Any questions from, uh, any comments from the panel? Does anybody have any experience with this penumbra catheter pump system to aspirate thrombus? Has anybody used it yet? So uh, we have, at our institution, we've not used it, um, so I didn't include it because I've never, uh, I never uh, used it. Um, but I didn't read sort of, uh, it may be a viable option for uh, some patients. Um, but I don't know really much more about the specifics of that. I mean, the, the results in neurointervention are pretty, pretty encouraging, so it seems like it would be a good application, but I, I don't have any practical experience yeah, one, with it. One of my colleagues actually published a case where they came up with the idea, they called a neurointerventionalist and was able to pull a clot from the left main, mm -hmm. large clot from the left main, after they have tried the thrombus aspiration with an end hole catheter, like a Pronto or an export, and completely been unsuccessful. So it seems that there's something we're not doing with the, with the regular end hole catheters like export that uh, something else may, may, help us, may help us do. Well, everybody's used one of these aspiration catheters where you get 10 cc's of blood and then it stops, and then you don't know yes. what, you know, that, that, that happens all the time. And that's sort of the, the, the problem with these catheters is they don't have the ability to maintain suction. Yeah, I mean, they tend to collapse on themselves, basically. Yeah, I think that's a good point that sometimes you, uh, it's hard to know if it's actually collapsing on itself or if it's a large thrombus that can sometimes right. be attached there. Yes. Um, and I think that part of that can be the difficulty uh, with this and uh, making sure that you're uh, aspirating from the guide at the same time as the catheter removal so as to prevent distal embolization. You talked about uh, angiojet. I mean, in my experience, it's been more or less disappointing. You know, it, it, you get a lot of bradycardia and you never quite clear all the thrombus. Better luck in the periphery of it, but uh, have you used uh, much? So antibody? in my fellowship, I did a total of one. <laughs> so uh, not that much experience uh, with it. Um, and like you said, I uh, didn't have the best result um, uh, as an end result with it. Um, but I think the sort of the bottom line sort of with treating all of these um, is really it's a multi-pronged approach. Uh, it's a combination of pharmacologic, mechanical, and aspiration sometimes. Um, but sometimes um, you may have six more success with one or the other. So where, where does your practice stand with uh, thrombus aspiration in the setting of primary PCI? Um, so specifically only for the large thrombus burden. Um, ideally, in, in patients sort of using that sort of criteria that we sort of showed earlier, um, that we, don't, we do not routinely do it. Um, but in the patient that um, with uh, Timmy Zero flow uh, down the vessel with evidence of a large thrombus or uh, some proof flow with a large thrombus, uh, we'll go ahead and do that. For stent thrombosis, it's usually our go-to uh, before anything. So we have a question from the audience. Yeah, you talked about penumbra. You know, we use the penumbra in the periphery more often, but one of the characteristics about the penumbra is they have that plunger, which is a wire, and it has a little bit of a dilated part on the wire, and it helps macerate the clot. So, for example, in the left main case where your colleague couldn't get the thrombus into the aspiration catheter, the advantage of the penumbra is just that you can actually take a wire that has a little indentation, so it can help macerate the clot. The only problem with that, obviously, is it can send stuff distally as well. Um, but I do think the penumbra probably could have some applications in the coronary, just to sort of macerate that sort of intermediate age clot where it doesn't suck in very well. 